So like I said, welcome to whatever the course number is. My name is Robert Cowherd and I am number four. There's the syllabus. It will soon be linked to Brightspace. The first thing I'm gonna figure out how to do is how to project. And I'm talking as I act. Which one beat? Thank you. As a reflex, if I talk through as I act, there will be a connection between my thinking and my actions. So that's two things we've already done. I've said, here's the syllabus. Uh, how do you extract what you need to know in a short amount of time, even though it's a big complex document? How do you link your actions with your thinking? What does I am number four mean? What do you want to get out of this investment? How many hours? It's a four, let's do the math, four hours a week in class times how many weeks? It boils down to 14, kind of, 13, really. Who's, who's got this? 56. And the assumption is, I don't know if you knew this, but um, the assumption is that for every hour in class, you spend two hours or three hours outside of class. No one asks you to spend three hours outside of class for every hour in class. So one to two hours, let's say two, just for the sake. So how many hours is that? And how much tuition? What, what is tuition per semester? 18, five, thank you, wow. 18, five to five, we're friends here, let's call it 19. And um, how much, how many credits are you taking now? 18, let's call it 18. <laughs> Anticipating what I'm about to do. Right? <laughs> Credit. So that's um, approximately a thousand dollars per credit. This is four credits. four credits. And four credits is don't tell me. <laughs> you can tell me. How much is it? Four thousand dollars. Okay. So one hundred twelve hours, four thousand dollars. And how old are you? Twenty one. 21, 20. So I'm going to say, in terms of the best years of your life, I'm going to say yes. Best. <laughs> okay, so 112 hours, $4,000, best years of your life. Are you sure you want to do this? Think about it. At your age, at exactly your age, a few months younger than you. I dropped out of college. Best thing I ever did. And I did it because there were other things that were more worth my effort, my time, my money, and the best years of my life. Okay, so this is all an investment. I'm setting the stage for you to ask this is one of the methods of this course, it is target questions. What do you, given the opportunity costs, this is real stuff, the rest of your life, not, it's not so much about the cost of whatever, it's, it's more the opportunity costs. What else could you be doing with your time, effort, money, 
in the best years of your life. Um, and when you come to grips with what else you could be doing, it helps what we're trying to do here. Because uh, uh, we're trying to do some important stuff and it just makes sense. It makes more sense in this context than uh, if we just start the class and say, okay, here's the history and theory of urbanism. Let's pick up where we left off in history 32. It just doesn't feel ethically viable given the context. So the, the key thing that should matter is what are your target questions for today? What are your target questions for the course? What are the target questions for your education? Uh, it, it's, it's a useful tool at every scale. What are the target questions of your life from that scale? What are the target questions of your engagement with uh, your the syllabus, whether it's soggy or not? What are the key things that you need to know? Let's start simple. Let's start with the syllabus. What are the key things you need to know in the syllabus? Let's see. We've already got a sketch writing going on. This is a beautiful start to the semester. Thank you for doing that. I would say it boils down to, if I had to boil it down to a very few takeaway things, there's a lot of detail in here and I don't want to diminish the importance of every word of this because uh, it's precious to me and should be to you, um, except for the last, um, the key takeaway things here, which you might want to uh, pay attention to, is uh, the things you always look for in, in the <coughs> syllabus on the first day. How much work is this class going to put? Right? Can I, what is the minimum amount? And let's be honest. What is the minimum amount of work and time and attention? Because I don't have time for this. Not only this, but the other thing, the studio thing. I've got a comprehensive studio is a serious undertaking. I need to invest every minute, every hour I can in a comprehensive studio. Uh, I, I don't have time for this class, right? And you may find that, that might be the context within which you engage this class, which makes it all the more important for your target questions to be sharply defined. How much is, the, how much is this class gonna take? What could go wrong? How am I gonna uh, get in and get out of this class uh, with the least amount of time and get the highest grade I can? Right, who's with me? This is okay. This is the reality. And this is another method uh, that we are going to spend a lot of time with in this course. It's called game theory. Does that sound familiar? Game theory? You've played games, right? You play video games? Game theory. This class, if this class were a video game, how do you score points? How do you kill the enemy and score points? How do you prevent yourself from being killed uh, uh, fast? How do you increase your level, move on to uh, next semester as, as effectively as possible? This is designed, this course is designed from a game theory perspective. Please be aggressive about uh, getting whatever you can get out of this class in the least amount of time. I am with you. As a matter of fact, that is the premise of the course. This is boot camp for surviving in the real world. Knowing what it takes to meet with professional success, we, your instructors, we're older, we've been around. That's, there's some good things about that. There's some bad things about that. But one of the good things 
is we know what it takes to succeed in the profession and in life. And one of the things are forming your target questions, knowing what can go wrong and how to avoid that, and knowing how to get the most out of what you're doing in the least amount of time. So what can go wrong? It says on page four, failure to attend a minimum of 70% of class meetings may result in failure of the course. Right, so I'm gonna do a little, can I write on this? I'm gonna do a little uh, sketch writing. It's gonna say, show up, right? This is, this is a simplification. I just, it's, I, I took this big amount of information and the goal is to simplify it as quickly as possible into just the things I need to know. Show up, show up on time. So there's more to it. Show up on time uh, and uh, uh, because it also says uh, repeated late arrival or early departure may be deemed the equivalent of an unexcused absence. So show up, show up on time. Sorry about the eight o'clock class time on Mondays um, for some of you. Uh, that applies. Show up, show up on time. Then there's another thing here that I want to emphasize. It's very similar. It's on the same page. Failure to submit a minimum of 70% of weekly assignments for all parts of the term project may result in a failing grade. So I'm going to summarize that as do the work, and this is 70% plus. This has caused some trouble for people in the past. I just finished teaching the History and Theory 2 course, and there's 109 students, and five of them somehow even though I gave this kind of an introduction to the course, they somehow missed that detail at 70%. And they actually dropped below 70% attendance or 70% submissions, believe it or not. And they just failed the course. There's no debate, no discussion. It's the most forgiving official attendance policy in school. It's just that we enforce it. So you may have heard a rumor that once you're in, what are they going to do? Not pass you along? Yes, not pass you along. You got to meet the minimum requirements. This is a serious endeavor. Um, and the reason I'm doing this, uh, it, for the most part, is to protect the integrity of the program for those of uh, us in the room who take this seriously. I mean, this, this is not a joke. This is real life. Um, and that's another part of this course is, and it's the main theme of today, is what, what can go wrong during your careers? And that should help sharpen your target questions. You, I assume you're all here at Wentworth because of this excellent return on investment. We prepare professionals to hit the ground running, rise through the ranks of the corporate structures and firm structures rapidly and become leaders very quickly. You're welcome, we do that. Uh, but part of the reason we're able to do that is we anticipate what can go wrong during your professional careers and we prepare you for it. So um, that's what we're gonna do. I have an agenda here somewhere. We have, you probably get the sense that we have much more to do than we have time to do it. But um, that said, what questions do you have about what I've said so far? It's okay. What are your names, though? Uh, Johanna. 
Okay. And who's missing? You know, there's a whole bunch of people who have class now from the eight o'clock group. Did you know that? Oh, they got put together. Yeah, we're, we, this is the thing we do. So you're here. Oh, go to the other class. I'm recording this. And it's, and it's my fault. It's my fault. Or it's the registrar's fault. But it's, let's say it's my fault. What's the other class? Yeah, but you, the elective part is not every day. You don't understand that, right? You elect, you elect to take the class. You elected to take that other class back in, I don't know, March. But now, you, now it's a class. It's the same seriousness as this class. I think you should go to that class. We're good for today. Are you sure he knows? And what's the name of the class? Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I hope not. Yeah. I don't. It, it really boils down to two things. And this is a sketch. This is a sketch writing. This is a demonstration of sketch writing. It boils down to two things. One, show up. Two, do the work. And there's a 70% detail. You'll, you'll get that. Okay. And that's sketch writing. But that's... Um, so what are your target questions? What do you need out of this course? Think about it while I figure this out. What is this called? What is it saying? Absence. Absence. Pro. Absence pro. Let's see how pro it is. I see crest on airplay. Mm. I have a crest on. Is that a crest on? Pressed on. Oh, look. What did I do? No, 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 no. When did it show up? Just two seconds ago. Okay. And who's on who's on the slideshow with me? Someone's on the slideshow with me. Or yeah. Let's see who that. It's an it's an anonymous otter, turtle. Okay. So, do you guys use WhatsApp? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is also um, if we were at Harvard, they would say. Don't take four classes, take three classes and consider class number four, your networking, your investment in, in building your network. Uh, because especially if you're going to Harvard, your relationships uh, with your colleagues are the foundation for your future career success. Well, we're not at Harvard, but it's still true. The relationships you forge here are the basis for your future career success. And, uh, and so I am going to, so maybe the, the most, one of the most important things, things to do I'm going to send this link to someone. 
someone uh, tell me their email address? Alan what is it? L Nasif. Yes. So your first your last name is Nasif. Yes. Your first name Boyal. You're sure it's not Nasif L? Okay. <laughs> Where have you been? Co op. How was it? Okay, I am sending Lyle a, uh, a WhatsApp link. And Lyle, your job is to get it to everyone else. Can you do that? I think that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So this WhatsApp link is our social media channel. There are uh, 41 students from last year's group already on it. So when you share something to this group, they're going to say, well, that, they're either going to say, this is part of the game theory approach, right? Remember, remember the costs. Did we mention student loans yet? Student loans figure heavily in this course. So think about the opportunity costs. Think about your student loans. Think about your career trajectory. Think about the networking value that you are gaining from your presence here in Wentworth. And uh, think about the opportunity to either uh, win or lose each time you post something to social media, game theory, right? So you're going to send something po to post something of interest to social media, to the WhatsApp group, and people are either going to say, well, that was stupid, or they're going to say, oh, <laughs> I've been looking for this, right? And notice the difference in the affect. And they're going to associate that feeling with your name. And it's going to be amplified by the very short, probably no more than one sentence uh, thing you say before the link. Are you with me? This is all familiar stuff, right? So, uh, so you're either going to you're either going you're either going to see your career prospects and your ability to pay off your student loans rise or fall. It's a game, right? So this is part of it. In a way, this is the, the, a key part of your career preparation, as they would tell you at Harvard. We're not at Harvard, but it's also true. So um, this is the outline. This is the itinerary for today's class meeting. Um, and this is really a crash course in how to succeed uh, in this class. And this class is boot camp for succeeding in studio in thesis in your careers. Okay, does that sound interesting? Because if your target question is, uh, how do I succeed? And that this course is for you. So why go to school? Um, why did I say I was number four? On a good day, I am the fourth most important source of understanding. And it's crucial to start the class with that because look at the architecture. What does this architecture tell us? Here, here I am in the light, right? I am the star. I am the professor. I have a doctorate from MIT. I'm super important. You're paying all this money for access to me. Me, 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 right? That's how it was when I went to school. And if you're paying attention, the world, we'll get to that, okay? We're not gonna do it the same way that I experienced it. In so many ways, we're gonna do it the opposite of the way I experienced it when I was in your seat, 
right? This is my therapy. This is my revenge. And this is my best shot at helping you do better, you this generation, do better than me in my generation. So the teacher is not the most important source of understanding. The word lecture means in Latin to read. We used to read from books because there was no printing press. Pathetic, right? We have printing presses. Why do we have lectures? Why are lectures? Why was the History Theory 2 course, when I started teaching it in 2015, why was I told you can't teach anything that's not in the book? Students can either read the book or they can come to lecture. They don't have to do both. Why in 2015 was that the situation at Wentworth Institute of Technology? Wow. We are going to do the opposite of that. If it's in the reading, I'm not going to talk about it in the lecture. If it's in the lecture, it's not going to be in the reading. That's not completely true. But I am not the most important source of understanding. The reading is not the most important source of understanding. On a good day, I'm number four. And I'm not to be trusted. You have to verify everything I say. You should trust me. I'm doing my best. But just to be sure, you should verify. The third most important source of understanding are your colleagues. They get you, they, they understand where you're coming from. They understand what your challenges are. They're paying the same student loans you are more or less. They're, they're facing the same career challenges that you are more or less. They are your third best source of understanding. What's number two? Can you guess? This is fun for me. Well, that's number three. Wow. Who said that? Wow. That's not number two. That's number one. Bingo. Number two is actually hard. It, when I, when I said, you know, all this and maybe we shouldn't be in school and I quit school when I was your age, all of that. Number two is the best reason to stay in school. This is like superpower. These are your superpowers. I don't know if you saw Sky High. Is that movie? <laughs> Superhero school? Oh, yeah. I love that movie. You are in Sky. This is Sky High. You are learning these incredibly powerful methods for making sense of the world. No one does what you do. No one has, no one can look out the window and understand what the section through mission name is, except for people with architectural training. The tools of your discipline give you special access to your surroundings that other people don't have. Your parents, unless they're designers, they don't see the world the way you do. They don't have your skills, your tools, your, your superpowers. Your ability to cut sections, your ability to do digital models, your ability to see as a result of that. Oh, look, it's right there. Um, it's really powerful. What are you going to do with that great power? What comes with great Great responsibility, more movie references here. So the surroundings, your world is the number one source of understanding. When I was sitting in your seat, the number one goal of the professors in architect, well, actually it's happening in the studio. The first moment I set foot in the architectural studio, we were told that we were nothing, we had knew nothing, and if we thought we knew something, you'd be either thrown out of school or, or beaten up emotionally. It was horrible. This was the tradition of architectural education in the 20th century. Some places were worse than others. I went to the worst place, I think, at the worst time. And we were empty vessels to be filled up with the fullness of the wisdom of the professors and didn't work so well. 
We're doing the opposite of that. George Costanza Day every day. Another reference. So no one knows that reference? I'll stop using it. Seinfeld, George Costanza Day. You do the opposite of what you think you should do. I'll stop using it. Right? <laughs> well, you don't know George. I, I'm sorry. It's just one episode, right? George Costanza. I <laughs> will Okay, I'll stop using it. Thank you for that. <laughs> feedback. Feedback is another one. So, um, so we're trying to do better, and we're not trying to do a little bit better. We're not trying to take what the 20th century education system gave us and do it a little bit better. Uh, that's just pathetic. These, uh, the problems that you are inheriting are not the inadequacies of our system. The problems that you are inheriting are a direct outcome of the system, the education system, the practice system of construction and architecture. And if, if, you, if you expect, if you do the same thing that we did in the 20th century and you expect a different outcome, that's the definition of, what is it? Insanity. Friends don't let friends do the same thing and expect a different outcome. So that's, the key insight of, well, you had this already, right? Didn't you have a lecture in history theory too? Do we need to do it again? You have notes from that. Did you, did you take notes? Do you have your notes? Who's got their notes? Where are they? Are they written down on paper? On your computer? No, oh, I don't have you don't have your computer? <laughs> Who's got their notes from that lecture? The final lecture of History 32. There was a guy, looked like me. I would love, so this is actually an important thing. I don't know how we're going to do this part of the course and it, how we do it depends on you to a large extent. We have three tools available. We're going to do something called sketch writing. Um, and we're going to do sketch writing when we engage the reading. We're going to do sketch writing when we engage the lecture. And it's an important skill um, that you've already seen in action. Right? You've already seen sketch writing in action. You take something that, I don't have time to read this whole thing. Well, but you need to know the essence of what's in this thing. And sometimes this thing is not a cute little page document. It is a staff. And your boss is going to say, um, Nassim, on Monday morning at nine in this conference room, you're going to report out and what we need to know, the project team, about this background information. And, and you're going to get a stack of books like this. And you know what you're going to say? Yeah. You can say, I got this. First of all, everyone's going to say, I got this because of the game theory of how you succeed in a firm. You don't whine and complain. You get fired when you whine and complain. And then what about your student loans? Um, right? You say yes. But the difference is when Leal, yeah. when Leal says, yes, I got this, she's going to say it with confidence. She's going to chuckle to herself because she's going to remember way back in 2022 when she mastered the skills 
of sketch writing. She's gonna figure out her target questions. What, what do I really need to know? I don't wanna be distracted by all this zoning code and all of this stuff. The zoning code has changed. I don't need to know any of that. I don't need to know about the industrial base because it's all gone. There's a new industrial base, so I'm gonna ignore it. The key skill that Leo. Leo. I keep seeing Leo. <laughs> Leo. Um, is the key skill is what to ignore. Right? When's the last time a professor told you that the most important thing you're going to learn in this course is what to ignore? I mean, how many times has someone told you that? <clears throat> right? But that is the mad skill. And so taking a sketch writing approach, uh, Leo is going to dive in, go through, she's going to find the stuff that matters, and she's going to dig deep and grab it, and she's going to get out, and it's not going to take her all weekend. And um, she's going to realize that uh, 9 a.m. at that meeting, she's a, she's a junior. It's, it's still a, a messed up culture in the workplace. She's uh, she's only going to get like five minutes to report on this stack of stuff. And she's going to stand up with confidence, right? And she's going to say, well, the key takeaway point is in one sentence, she's going to give the key takeaway point. And then she's going to back it up with three sub points that all are in relationship to the key takeaway point and then she's going to leave with a key question that uh, deserves to be the focus of the next phase of the project and they're going to and the bosses especially say oh you gave up your whole weekend to read every word of the stack of books, and what are you going to say? I sure then. Maybe you're going to say. <laughs> or more impressively, you're going to say, "Are you kidding me? I I went through a baby shower from that from my best friend who I I met in the course last you know summer of 2022, and uh, you know I I only I actually to tell you the truth I only spent uh, three hours." You might confide in them on if they can be trusted. But it's very impressive to spend a whole weekend to get it down to this. It's even more impressive to do it in three hours. So that's so the question is how are we going to do this? In the past, I just left it to everyone to like do their own sketch writing. But that's so 20th century. I think. We should do it as a group. What do you guys think? Because that's how we do things in the 21st century. How do we do it as a group? Yeah, how would we do it as a group? How do you what what tools do you guys like to use? Google Drive? Google Drive? So that's one. What else do we have? <laughs> I mean, yeah. What's the problem with doing it on WhatsApp? Well, first of all, there's 41. Of, we'd have to make a private group, which is us, 26, 27. So, a special group of 27. What else could we use? Pass around a notebook. Pass around a notebook. Wow. Paper. Oh, we used to do it that way. It was actually not so bad. Um, let me show you some options. We'll cut back to this Anthropocene thing. But I am curious, did anyone find their notes? Keep, is there any hope that you'll find anything? Yeah. Somewhere at home. Paper. Digital. 
You got it? Yeah. I don't know if it's the exact last type, but I got all the work. You see the word Anthropocene? <laughs> and do you have the Zoom link? Because you could project it. Can you project from there? Uh, I don't think I I mean, I've got an iPad like one, uh, and I can use Zoom on it. So what am I looking for? I'm thinking out loud. So here's another one. Have you ever heard of Zotero? So um, the geek, the geek in me, when I got my first computer, I was living on the island of Java. It was 1992. And uh, I invented a piece of software to keep track of my notes. How many 30 years later, uh, it's now Zotero. I don't, I'm not sure that they got it for me, but I, they might have. Um, but I don't mind. Um, but uh, Zotero will take things um, like any one of these. Uh, I can, I have, I might have notes. So I, I might have the full text. I might have notes. I might have a link to the original document. Uh, but the key thing that this allows me to do is it integrated with, with Word and with Google Docs. And so I can just pop in a footnote or a bibliography, and it's all automated. This is the uh, Space Age, which used to be, what do we call it now? This is the most sophisticated set of tools for managing sources that there is. And there's a group feature. Um, so this is an option as well, but it's kind of complex. And we could all join. So this is an option, so Tara. It's kind of the, the, at the other extreme. It's probably the most sophisticated tool for keeping track of notes. So you can do a search and it'll take you right there. Like um, uh, we could find the notes from that lecture. Like I can find notes from a lecture I attended in 1996 um, using my old song. Um, and, I can, and I have tens of thousands of pages of notes that I can access instantaneously. Um, if I have to write something or if I have to tell someone, something. Um, and so imagine this scenario. You're in, it's five years from now. Um, you, you really, your partner is pressuring you to buy real estate, but you can't afford real estate. You've got these student loans, you can't buy a place. Right? It's just not time yet. And you're in a meeting. Again, it's a little bit later on this project. And the person you need to impress to get the promotion in order to afford to get the raise to pay off your student loans and buy real estate because your relationship is suffering because of your financial situation. So you get you get the situation, it's game theory. Um, and the person you need to impress in order to save your relationship uh, financially uh, says something about the population. Uh, yes, the question, what's the, populate, what's the population going to be in 2070 or 2100? You say, oh, I know I have that in my notes from that guy, whatever his name was, the number four guy. He said it in that lecture on the Anthropocene. Right? What is the population, what is the peak human population going to be? in the year 2100. Your relationship depends on it. 10.9 billion. Wow, how did you know that? I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it 11. All right. 
<laughs> so you don't need the notes from the guy that time. Let's say that guy that time said something that you can't Google, right? We had this insight. And you remember, ah, oh, that's important. I'm going to need that in the future. You need to find it. If it's in a notebook at home, you're not, you're out of luck. Right? If it's in Zotero in your tablet or in the chip that's embedded in your neck, you got it, right? And so, or in your phone. Let's say, so uh, this, this could work. I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that's, this could work. And then there's a fifth thing that I want to show you um, in a minute. So let me buzz through this next part of the presentation because it'll make more sense. So um, we've, we've talked about how the system is broken. Sorry about that. Do you remember this? This was in that lecture that time. Uh, it talks about the dawn of the industrial age uh, and how this, this is welcome to the Anthropocene, this video. And it talks about population increase and how uh, the sources of the climate emergency uh, and why and this gets back to the question, what could go wrong in your careers? What could go wrong in your lives? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot that is going wrong that we've never seen before. There is no precedence. There is no understandable solution. We have no solution. Sorry. Um, so if we just do the same thing, if we have the same class that we had last summer or when I was in school, we're just making the problem worse. We're not, we're not just failing to meet the need. We're not just falling short of what we could be doing. We're actually making things worse. If we do a really good job teaching this class and your education, um, uh, if we do a really good job executing this course the, in the old way, we are making things worse. So let's not do that. Let's take a critical look at how we do school. Let's take a critical look at how we do architecture and let's figure out how to do it better so that we can reverse what's been happening. Who's with me? Does that sound good? By the way, the world will love you for it. And you will pay out those student loans faster if, if you pull this off. <clears throat> there are. I was never taught what laws there are. Let me repeat, I was not taught the laws for the country I live in. But I know how Henry VIII killed his women, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Now that's in my head instead of financial advice. I was shown the wavelengths of different hues of light, but I was never taught my human rights. Apparently there's 30. Do you know them? I don't. Why the hell can't we both recite them by want I know? Yes, metamorphic and sedimentary box. Yet I don't know squat about trading stocks or how money works at all. Where does it come from? How does the thing that motivates the world function? Not taught to budget and disperse my earnings. I was too busy there rehearsing curse. It didn't learn how much it cost to raise a kid and what an affidavit is, but I spent days on what the quadratic equation is. That it's a B plus or minus the square root to B squared minus 4AC over 2A. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. They maybe learned that over basic first aid or how to recognize the most deadly mental disorders or diseases with preventable causes or how to buy a house with a mortgage if I could afford it because abstract maths was deemed more important than advice that would literally save thousands of lives.
But it's cool, because now I could tell you if the number of unnecessary deaths caused by that choice was prime. <laughs> Never thought present day practical medicines, but I was told what the ancient Hippocratic method is. I've got a headache, the pain is ceaseless, what should I take? Um, maybe try some leeches? Could we discuss domestic abuse and get the facts? Or how to help my depressed friend with a mental state? Um, no, but learn mental maths, because you won't have a calculator with you every day. They say it's not the kids, the parents are the problem. Then if it's not the kids, the parent, that's the problem solved then. All this advice about using a condom, but not for when you actually have a kid when you want one. I'm only fluent in this language, but serious, the rest of the world speaks too. Do you think I'm an idiot? He chose the soul alone with the political systems of like a typical citizen. Now I don't know what I'm voting on, which policies exist or how to make them change. Maybe we should pull and put the process. So in 18, I was expected to elect a representative from a system I had never, ever, ever been presented with. But I won't take it. I'll tell everyone my childhood was wasted. I'll stare at everywhere how I was educated and insist these pointless things don't stay in school. Okay. You get it. So, remember this? So, yeah, 11 billion peak human population is, is going to hit 11 billion. When uh, someone like me stands in front of you and says the current human population is 7.8 billion, and we have a real problem because it's about to become 8 billion, that's a waste of time. That's a distraction from the reality. The world we are designing for is a world of 11 billion people. That's the world we designed for. That's the only number that matters in terms of human population. And if you remember, and when you access your notes, because we don't have time to go over everything, I'm just gonna skim over some key points. Um, the key thing is not the human population, unless you are working on the problem of women and girls' education in Africa. If you're talking about women and girls' education in Africa, which is something that Wentworth Architecture students do, Jackie Aguiar, I don't know if you know her, her thesis project was a school in Ghana, and she's doing it. She's going to go and do it. Um, and so if you're Jackie, then yes, talk about population, because education of women and girls is what uh, makes the difference between dropping the curve to 10 billion or this going up to 13 billion. Both of those scenarios are possible. It will be 10 or 13, depending on women and girls' education in Africa. Unless you're going to deal with women and girls' education in Africa, we don't care about human population. It's just the reality. For the sake of this course, in two weeks, we're going, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about informal settlements. The biggest game in pr the production of housing in the world, in human history, will be the growth of informal settlements in Caracas and Lagos and Jakarta and places like that. That's an important thing to understand. And that's an important context for your career time. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is we are thickening the sense of the present moment. You might get art daily posts on your phone and you get to see the next beautiful thing that someone in China has built. That's great. But it's not about last week's fancy building. It's not, it is about last week's fancy building. But it's not just about last week's fancy building. You need to be thinking, of, in this class, we will be thinking about a big now. The now that includes the peak years of your career practice. When will you be taking over the firm? When will you be making partner? When will you be uh, winning awards? When will you be your single person firm, your partnership? When will you be recognized? When will you be getting the big commissions? What year is that? What year is that? Graduate in what? 24. 24? Well, 23. You get your master's maybe in 24. Maybe 
take time off, 20, let's, let's say 20, 24. And then when do you hit your peak years of impact? When are you gonna take over? When are the people in the room gonna turn to you and try to impress you with how skillful they are at sketch writing? What year is that? Twenty thirty four. Wow, fast. Watch, watch her. <laughs> She's already got the sketch ready. So twenty thirty four. Let's say twenty forty. Right. So twenty forty and on. You guys are going to be in control. You could. You will be saying, my student loans, best investment I ever made, those student loans, that education, best 112 hours, I hope, best uh, quarter million dollars for my education. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? That is the sticker price. It's actually quickly rising to around $300,000 this is the sticker price of your education. You're not paying that much. No, well, someone is not paying that much. But that's the that's the dollar value placed on this education. It's about $300,000. And we all know that if you don't get a college education, you're in trouble. Your prospects are not that great. If you do get a college education, it's guaranteed you're going to do fine, right? No. Some of your friends, and I hope none of them are in this room, are going to look back and say, oh my God, what did I do? All that money is gone, except now I have to pay back my student loans and I really didn't get much out of it. Um, I didn't, it, didn't, it didn't translate into something where I'm having an impact in a meaningful career that actually uh, can justify the best years of my life, uh, $300,000, et cetera, right? So now we're back to the 70% rule. That's part of it. It's partly to protect your investment, to make sure that you end up on the right side of that line, that you're one of those people that around the year 2040, give or take, depending on how ambitious you are, uh, you're gonna be saying, best investment I ever made. So that's the perspective. Um, and so the way I was taught this course and the way a lot of your colleagues were taught this material, it goes back to a lot of us took the same course at MIT from the same guy, Julian Viner. We took a version of this course. It started, do you remember that? Have you heard of the name Kevin Lynch? He wrote The Image of the City. So Kevin Lynch taught this course, a version of this course at MIT. Then he passed it off to his star student, Julian Beiner. And he taught for 30 something years. Uh, and then he passed it off to no one because he wanted it to end with him. Uh, and we all took the course from him. I took the course with him. Then I TA'd the course twice. Then I co-taught the course. And uh, we're not doing it the way he did it. He taught the same thing every year, year after year. And for better or worse, we're changing this course week by week. So that's why we can't figure out this question. Um, but the way we used to do this course is we'd start from the dawn of time. And we'd go back to Jaktal Huyuk. I don't know if anyone's Turkish and can correct my pronunciation. Jaktal Huyuk. Um, and the dawn of time and the emergence of religions and the Fertile Crescent. And then if we have time, we'll make it up to the 1960s. We're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna start from the future. We're gonna start from, we are starting, we've already started from the year 2100, peak population of uh, 11 billion, let's just call it 11 billion. And we're gonna go backwards. We are going to, the perspective of this course is what can go wrong? What are the key challenges that you are gonna face uh, on and around 2040 
Uh, and what do you wish you had learned back when you were spending what used to seem like a lot of money, the $300,000 investment that someone made in your education? Man, how come they didn't teach us that? How come we didn't talk about this? How come we were not prepared to face this challenge that we're facing now in 2040? What is that challenge? What is that challenge that you're gonna face in 2040 that you're gonna wish you had been prepared for back in 2022, that you'd started preparing for? Anything? Yeah, the emergency, climate emergency. That's, that's the big one, right? Sometimes we will refer to that as the thing because there is no other thing. But what else is there? The climate is not, oh, doesn't cover the whole thing. Climate emergency is not the whole thing. What else could possibly go wrong? Lack of resources. That's kind of part of the thing. I guess the like the gap between like the upper class and lower class is increasing, so we need more money. You you're just stacking up the points here. Are you gonna let him do that? Okay. Um, yes. And so we've got two things, right? But when I say the thing. How could I mean two things? Is there something else? Or population. I mean, that would probably be the thing. Yeah. It's connected to climate change and it's connected to inequality. These, are these things connected? They're so connected because the game theory approach to the people who control the wealth is. We're heading into a crisis. What do we do? Let's, let's say we are the wealthiest 21 people in the world. Okay, this is a game theory. This is part of the course. Game theory. We're the 21 wealthiest people in the world. Okay, let's decide what to do. We're in Davos, Switzerland. What are we going to do? We need a strategy. We're projecting forward 2040. What's our strategy? We're the 21 wealthiest people. The world is going back up. Require um, zero carbon emissions and also um, create some sort of. Um... We're not Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gates is the exception. Bill Gates is the exception. We are Elon Musk. <laughs> we are Zucker, whatever his name is. Right? So we go to Mars, right? We create a life raft and we protect our own. We protect our wealth. That's what's going on here. No one lives here. No one needs the space. This is an investment property. The reason it's this tall is because I, it was in that lecture, right? Did you find it? I have my notes, but I don't know if I have anything We'll review it. I guess we'll have to review it because none of you have your notes with you. Okay. So we're going to start. We're going to, this is the target year, right? Or somewhere, somewhere in the future. That's the target. And we're going to work back. So the way I like to teach the course is not from the dawn of time to uh, somewhere as close as we can get to the present, like in the 60s. Um, instead, uh, I was asked to teach the history course at MIT a few years ago, and I said, I'm going to, this is where a lot of this started. I said, how about if we do it in reverse chronological order? And I was told, no, you can't do that. That's insane. Don't do that. And I said, I'm going to do that. And so that's what I did. It was really hard. Um, it was really hard. But it, it was a George Costanza. I'm going to stop using that. It was the opposite. It was a way of doing the opposite of what we did before. 
okay? And it offers the promise, not just this empty hope. It's a promise. It actually is promising. For example, you notice in the syllabus, um, you may notice that we start in week 11 and we go backwards. What's up with that? That's because we're starting in the future and we're going back to the present and then we're going back as far as we can. And where does the syllabus end? I don't know what's going on with the schedule this summer, but the problem is we don't have any Mondays. We have all these Juneteenth, and 4th of July, and Memorial Day. Like what's going on? There's no Mondays. So this is a, sh sorry, it's a shorter semester. We should, we should only charge you like 3,900 for this course. We should give you, should give you a rebate, right? We're not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a day, right? Um, so, so we're going to miss out on two weeks of content that I usually teach as part of this course. Sorry, we don't have time, right? But we're not going to stray from our target, which is 2040. We're getting ready for the battle that you will be fighting in 2040. Remember, superheroes school. Um, when I give a lecture, it's not a, the, the visual that we're used to is something like this. That the professor is super smart, right? The professor is super smart. <laughs> super smart. <laughs> kind of smart. <laughs> and the students are not smart, and we're kind of oh oh. Let's try to let's try to let's try to be like the professor. Please, don't be like. That. You got to do way better than that. This is not what we do. This is what we do. I'm going to change the scale. This is the ground. Well, first of all, you're not at zero. You are the world's foremost experts on your own life experience. Not only do we not expect you to be empty vessels for this, the richness that we bestow upon you, you're welcome. No, you are experts. We need you to bring your expertise every day to what we do in architecture, to studio. We need your expertise. So whatever your experience has been in your 20 to 21 years, uh, you bring it. We need every ounce of your experience, your life experience, especially if your life experience is different uh, and offers a perspective uh, that enriches the group perspective. That's really important. And so you are already here. I'm just a few years ahead of you. So this is like bouncing on the trampoline. And I'm really good at this. You and I are bouncing on this trampoline, and I'm going like this right before you hit and and popping you up. Can you feel it? Can you feel that? You're going, you're going up. Right? That's what I want this class to feel. You're going way beyond anything I've ever done, or any of us have ever done. That's the task. So that's the springboard. Maybe I should say trampoline, because that's something you guys feel in your bodies, right? You have that vivid experience of double bounce? Okay. And so uh, one, of the thing, one of the other things that went wrong in the 20th century education is we, we had this weird idea that architecture was this thing. Architecture was in here and it was beautiful and pure and, and rich. And it's not for everyone. Not everyone gets architecture. Not everyone uh, should be led into pristine white museums of architecture. And as a matter of fact, one of the purposes of the faculty is to guard the barricades and keep those who are not worthy 
from entering into the world of architecture. And the other thing is to keep architecture from being sullied by the outside world. When I wanted to, in, when I was doing my thesis in 1938, I was told that you can either do good architecture or you can solve these problems. You can't do both. You know, say it out loud. And I've actually heard people here say those things, but it was a long time ago. In the last 10 years, I haven't heard that kind of talk anymore. There is, uh, there's a, probably a line, there's no longer a barricade around architecture. There might be a trace on the ground where the barricade once stood. Now the bar now architecture is everywhere, and architecture is in everything. There are certain principles and values and skills that were developed out of this pristine, protected laboratory that used to be the barricaded realm of architecture. And those are valuable skills. But the reason they're valuable is because they have so much power beyond architecture itself. So there is nothing that happens in this world independent of architecture. There is no meaningful architecture that is independent of the world. That is the premise of this course. So we're going to talk about race. We're going to talk about economics. We're going to talk about everything. Everything that might possibly help you kill it in 2040 when you need to kill it, we're going to talk about it. And if I'm missing something, you speak up. Remember this? This is a fundamental premise of the course that your architectural projects operate within larger systems. And those larger systems are influenced by culture. So the way I just said that, it kind of feels like it, this is the thing. The culture is the dominant thing. The culture uh, determines certain systems, I don't know, capitalism, and that the system is what sets the framework in which our projects are produced. Okay, so you could put arrows this way. Culture is a given, it determines the systems, how the operating systems work, and the operating systems are what set the boundaries and the frameworks within which we produce our projects. Is that true? I experience it every day that way. So yes, that is true. But is that, the, is that where it ends? When our students get to the thesis program, they look at cultural forces that interest them, they study the operating systems within which those cultures uh, establish. Extractive capitalism is the dominant one right now. And then they execute projects in a way that are designed to have an influence on the system. And on a good day, that influence extends to a cultural transformation. The obvious one is green building, right? If you can, if you can produce a sustainable home or sustainable fill in the blank that is actually affordable and beautiful and wonderful, then that has the potential to change the system. And that's the obvious one that we're all trying to do. Let's do really good architecture. Maybe it can move the needle on what is possible system systemically, and that might lead to cultural changes that allow us to survive the thing. That's the obvious one, but there are other ones. So this is a reflexive relationship. The, the forces, the cause and effect moves in both directions. Remember the word reflexive? Look it up in your notes. Here's, here's uh, a demonstration of that. The slave ship is an architecture that structured the relationship between the enslaved and the enslavers. And so this architecture 
uh, according to Nicole Hannah Jones, is something that produced race. Race was constructed. This is a vivid example of how race was constructed by an architecture. It's when the project, the arrow, you know, would, would slavery have happened without the slave ship? Of course, these things are not cause and effect. They are reciprocal reflexive relationships. But this, the system of race construction was the architecture of the slave ship was part of, part and parcel of the construction of race that we have inherited today. And architects are at risk of doing a slightly better version of this. That this is, this is inhumane. This is much better, right? It's much better. So if we're not careful, we're gonna end up producing better slave ships. <clears throat> And this is a real issue that the American Institute of Architects is dealing with today. There's no more slave ships, but uh, solitary confinement. The American Institute of Architecture has signed um, a statement saying, we refuse. We refuse to work on the design of prisons that include solitary confinement cells. They are inhumane and we won't do it. Okay, so some of you, in uh, when you graduate and you're looking at your first student loan bills, uh, you're going to be attracted to working for firms that are offering you positions. Acom, A E C O M, is the largest architecture firm in the world, I think, maybe just the United States. But they build prisons. They build prisons with solitary confinement. Lots of our uh, Wentworth graduates work at ACOM. Some of my favorite students are working at ACOM. I'm hoping we can do that. Sometimes uh, the client is dictating what we do and we say, eh, what are you gonna do? I'm an architect. I serve at the pleasure of my client. I have no options. Do you have options? Yes, you do. One of the skills that this course emphasizes is understanding what it is that, uh, what the world, what does the world need and how aligned are the needs of the world with the needs of a client or a firm. And those are the firms you wanna work for. Instead of working for ACOM, see if uh, Mass Design Group is hiring because that's what they do. They look for alignments between clients and the needs of the world. Okay. Um, I'm skipping some things. So sketch writing, um, here's another one. Here's another tool. So here's the first reading. It's called Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. It's uh, in a, I'm demonstrating another alternative tool that's not on our list here. I just became aware of this and I don't really know how to use it, um, but it is available. It's called hypothesis, and it looks like this. 
it's a way of annotating a text. Um, tell me, tell me if you think this is an attractive way. Um, I'm reading along, I'm reading the text. I, I see this statement, and it's like, this feels important. And so I highlight it, I click on the annotation tool, and uh, I write what I'm thinking. Civilizations, so it says, civilizations have marched blindly towards disaster because humans are wired to believe that tomorrow will be much like today. And so that explains why, despite all everything we know, we just keep doing what we're doing, expecting it to be work out fine. So why? So my my annotation, my question, uh, three questions. Why is that the case? What conditions could incentivize, which is a game theory term? What conditions could incentivize a different behavior? What if today we experience disaster, which we are, and thus following this logic, we start to expect disaster tomorrow as well. So I have no answers. It just sparks questions. I've started, I've gotten the ball rolling uh, with this tool, which is an extension uh, available here on Chrome. And it's something, the thing, the reason I like this tool uh, is that I'm, I'm now gonna, I'm now gonna do the thing that is part of game theory, part of design thinking, and it falls into the category of empathy. It's the number one skill of a designer is empathy. The first thing we do is we have empathy for the end user, user experience design. So I'm gonna use the voice of student. I do my best to empathize with students while I recognize that even though I was a student for 14 years, a college student for 14 years, even though I dropped out, I was a college student for 14 years, but even though I was a college student for 14 years, I will never know what it's like to be you. Right? So both are true. I have to try to understand what it's like to be you. I also understand I will never know what it's like to be you. But here's my attempt. I apologize if I get it wrong. I like to take my own notes. I, I don't want everyone looking over my shoulder every time I have a thought that I think is valuable. What if people make fun of me like they did that time? Remember that time? People make fun of me, make fun of you. Like, I, I, I want to just have be quiet with my thoughts, engage the reading, write freely, and then share only the things that I feel comfortable sharing. This allows that. I can take my notes in a way that's private. And then when I see something that other people are are not quite catching on to yet. I can share that one thing that I get out of the reading. Yes. It's called Hypothesis. And it's only available. I have instructions and a link. It's only uh, in Brightspace under the reading. So it's only available uh, outside of the Wentworth realm, because Wentworth, you know. So I, I have to sign in as a civilian, not as a professor. Um, if you go on Brightspace, I think you guys should always have your laptops with you in this class because there are new tools and we're going to use them. We're going to try them out and we're going to reject them and try new tools. Sorry, and you're welcome. That's the world we live in. We, you know, you get used to a set of tools, and then you're asked to learn a new set of tools. AutoCAD is not your friend when it comes to doing some things, right? AutoCAD was never a good tool for anything. Sorry, there are new tools to learn. Revit is pretty good, <clears throat> but guess what? <clears throat> Next week, there's gonna be another tool that's even better than Revit. 
better than I am. Get used to it. Right. So, do you guys? So this is this tool called hypothesis. I'm curious. I'm not convinced. So I think we have three candidates. You know all about them. So Taro, I don't know. It's a little bit too. And that's our thoughts. I'm curious. I'm not convinced. I'm curious. You ready? Okay. The audience is the same thing. It's these kids don't know. If we have to move things, the like hypothesis can do both of us. You can share it with the other people. Yeah, like um, if you went into hypothesis, this one is shared with the group City 22. But I have other things that I kept to myself. Sounds pretty good. Do you want to try this? Who's okay trying this? Who doesn't want to try this? Okay, let's try this. The beautiful thing is it's set up on Brightspace. So um, let's do this between now and um, Monday. Um, read this, take notes privately, and then share the things that you feel comfortable sharing. Share at least one thing. And we'll see if we can construct a collective take on this reading. This reading is very short compared to most readings we're going to have. It's, it's really just that. So is that okay? Everyone's clear? It's in Brightspace. And the instructions for accessing all of this stuff is in Brightspace. Some of you are going to get it, and then uh, others are not going to get it right away. We don't have time to learn new software. Just ask your friend, how do you do this? And they'll help you out. Any questions about the reading? So, so normally on a Wednesday, you will show up having read something and done a sketch writing, which is just taking notes. We'll, we'll get into the details of sketch writing. If you're curious about sketch writing, there's a link in Brightspace to the bigger description. We're gonna do it bit by bit. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Every year I do it, you know, I just throw, I throw the sketch writing at you and I throw the analysis at you. I just think it's too much. Who's right? It's just too much. So we're going to gently ease into it. Just take some notes. Yes. Uh, just bring it to class for now, for Friday. We're doing this on hypothesis, right? We're doing this on hypothesis. Okay, we're about halfway through the content I want to cover. Yes. There was something uh, not that we were going to do the class, but on one slide, there's something that was in the middle. Ah, the analysis. So remember the analysis? So before we get to the analysis, we, I wanna, if that's what we do during, uh, if that's how we engage the reading. And by the way, here's the, the rule of thumb. Um, I, I'm, I'm now student voice. I don't have time for this, right? This pisses me off. I don't have time for this. If you're a little pissed off, that's the proper mindset. That's a proper mentality 
to this course. Friends don't let friends spend 16 hours doing the reading, right? It's self-destructive. You give yourself a hug, two hours, right? Uh, if Leal can go through that whole stack, you can go through a 30-page reading, not this week, right? But next, for next Wednesday, you're going to have a chunky reading. Um, decide how much, you know, if, if I sat down on the beach to read uh, 30 pages of a novel, it might take me two hours. Right? I'm a slow reader. I'm a little slower than most people. Right? So, but we don't have time for that. Friends don't let friends. I want to be, I want to have read it, reread it, skim, you know, I, and generated all of my sketch writing in two or three hours. The first time you do it, it's going to take three hours, four hours. The second time you do it, three hours. And then from then on, between one and two hours. I'm going to do the reading and I'm going to do the sketch writing and, and I'm going to get into the rhythm of this and I'm going to own that, these sets of skills. Um, then the next thing is the lecture. Who's taking notes? So on paper, um, uh, we'll talk. So then hey, we, hey. we do the whole lecture thing, right? Remember this? The Netherlands. So the key, th the key takeaways of this uh, lecture, I'm gonna move a little quickly here, is first of all, getting in touch with the urgency of the situation you are inheriting is part of what mobilizes your effectiveness as professionals. It is unprofessional to continue doing business as usual. That is unprofessional. It is unethical. The key to success in this career and increasingly in all professions, if you're a civil engineer and you're doing things the way they did 20 years ago, you're fired, you're, you're bankrupt, you're out of business. Same with architecture. You've got to embrace the urgency of the crises, the multiple overlapping crises that we are facing. And so in this class, our starting point is, remember that lecture um, two springs ago? The Netherlands, they were below sea level. What did they do? They turned, they took all these flooding deaths and they create, they designed a landscape system that produced one of the most successful economies today on the planet, a design powerhouse, in part because every square meter of the Netherlands is a piece of architecture that was designed. It's not just a piece of architecture. It's also a political system that requires cooperation. We are all Dutch now. Game theory. Singapore, in 1965, they were worse than Calcutta. They were facing poverty, starvation, uh, com rising communism. Uh, Malaysia uh, hated the Chinese that dominated Singapore. And so Singapore didn't gain independence from Malaysia. Singapore was ejected. Singapore was cut off. The expectation was that people would die in massive numbers in Singapore. And so faced with that challenge, like the Dutch, they did what they needed to do. We are all Singaporean. They coordinated the location of high density housing with their mass transit network. They co-located the highest density with very high service stations. We now do this every Tuesday, every day of the week. Architects are out there doing what we call transit-oriented development. We are co-locating high density uh, development with 
mass transit. Just look out the window. Can you see it? Can you see Ruggles in Northeastern? The towers in Northeastern? No. Well, transit-oriented development, it's basically Singapore. It's what we do. We are all Singaporean now. We should be so lucky, right? Have you been? Oh my God. Dubai. Dubai is scary. And have you seen one Dalton place? It's Dubai. We live in Dubai, right? That tower is not a product of demand for housing or hotels or anything. That tower is the product of a demand for invest, investment. No one's going to live there. When, when the sun goes down and you are on your way home from studio, just look up at the tower. How many lights are on? No one lives there. It's just an investment. Every time a luxury unit sells in one Dalton Tower, your rent in Brighton goes up. Sorry. We all live in Dubai now. Bilbao and the star of the show, in part because of Manuel Delgado and Ignacio Cardona, the star of this course, the star of the urbanism concentration is Medellin, Caracas, Latin America. In a way, the Latin American reference point is the most important reference point for design in the 21st century. This is the man who started it, really the focal point, and he came, the, the month he left office as mayor of Medellin, Colombia, he came to Wentworth because we are the place that is connected with what's going on. Um, and so this is the foundation for everything we do. This is just a quick review of the lecture. Um, All these slides on Brightspace. These slides, this whole show is on Brightspace. So um, what now do we do? Here's the 6 p.m. on Saturday thing. Here's what I want you to do. Is there a clock? Do you have to go? Okay. Oh, we have plenty of time. Okay. Year after year, and I, we did it to you in history theory too. We threw that analysis assignment at you. Remember that? We're going to do an alt. We're going to do the next stage of the analysis assignment. Uh, it's very, very similar, but we're not going to draw by hand. We're going to use Photoshop, and we're going to build it piece by piece. So maybe you were successful in the analysis assignment. Uh, two springs ago, maybe you were less successful. It's okay. Get another shot. <clears throat> Let's build it bit by bit, right? So it's going to end up looking a lot like this. This was drawn by hand. Uh, this is the caption. We're going to do exactly the same rules for the caption. So you thought that you were escaping this whole thing? You're not. It's not. <clears throat> this is what you're going to need to do your entire careers. If you weren't going to need to do it during your careers, we wouldn't ask you to do it now. That's what we do. And the footnote, you're never going to leave the footnote. As a matter of fact, you know what? I'm so traumatized by the experience of getting the footnotes wrong in the goddamn thesis book that when you get the footnote wrong after a certain point, when we get to a certain point in the semester, you don't do the footnote right. Zero, do it over. You get it wrong again, zero, do it over. I will accept it when your footnote is right. And that applies to your image source too. Sorry, it's for your own good. You'll thank me later. But we're not gonna do drawings. We're not gonna do drawings. This is the tradition of drawing. This is Weldon Priest who taught here for decades. He treated streets as if they were rooms. He drew streets as architecture. Sorry, this resolution is so poor. But 
Weldon Priest was a giant influence on the urbanism concentration. Lots of different ways to draw architecture. We used to do, we used to do views from above like this uh, that were available on Google Earth. No, no more. No more views straight up above. What we want, and your job for your job for Tuesday, no, your job for Saturday at six is to select an image. And the images we like are oblique, oblique perspectives. So on Brightspace, there's uh, access to the whole analysis assignment in its entirety. So we're not gonna do the whole analysis assignment. We're gonna do just the first few steps. So the first thing we want you to do is select an image. So read that first step on how do you choose the right image? The key thing, and you're gonna hear me say these words, about on average, in an average summer, I think I said about 153 times. That's the running average. So here it is, the time number one. You want to put the architectural scale of human experience prominently in the foreground at a scale when we can read it. People experiencing the space. And in the background, the larger pattern of urban form. It says that in the instructions on how to select an effective image. It should show something that you 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 don't have to know where it's going. Uh, if you select the image based on instinct. In the early, remember back in history 32, sometimes it would take you two, three hours just to choose your image, right? Go with your gut. Choose an image that feels rich, that you have questions about. Say, oh, oh, what's going on there? I wonder what's going on there. And then two, analyze. Use a very, very transparent colored overlay to pick out key elements, key relationships. key details, and you don't know what you're doing necessarily. You're just asking questions. Huh, what's this? Huh, what's that? Huh, what's this? Is it related to this? That looks different. I'm gonna give it a different color. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going on Insta. But make sure that we, your reader, have access to the base data. You are inviting us to read through your overlays and verify your speculations. The picture we're choosing is it is the criteria? Like what's the criteria for the image we're choosing? If I choose it, any image, like a tree. Um, I'm gonna make it easy for you. I'm gonna say choose an aerial view. in maybe in Colombia of a library park. And I would prefer that you do not choose the King of Spain library park. There's about 20 of them now um, in a, in a Better version of the course we divide it up and coordinate. We don't need to do that. So I want you. Uh, there's something. It's it's um, a library park. is not a generic term. It's a specific term. It was these are these were built between 2004 and the present, and they are interesting pieces uh, worthy of research. And we want to see the architecture and the context. We wanna see the architecture and the context, and we wanna understand the relationship between the library, the park, and the context surrounding. This is not a library park. 
Um, but we want to understand that's pretty, isn't it? Part of the reason it's so pretty is that the color is subtle and it's very specific. When these are successful, it's because you zoom in and you use your mad skills, your magnetic lasso, your quick select tool in Photoshop, and you get it pixel for pixel. You start with the high resolution when you do your image search, you click on the large images. So you only get high resolution images. You zoom in in Photoshop and you capture it pixel for pixel so that it looks like the road has been painted. And uh, you don't put the red over the things behind it. You run the color underneath that image so that it feels like the actual reality of the ground has been colored. <clears throat> the third thing we want you to do is we want you to highlight at least five things, a minimum of five, five things in, in the old assignment in history theory two, you would label it with annotations. You'd say this thing is doing this thing. This time we want you to just say it as five statements. <clears throat> the crosswalk uh, is the dominant thing that interrupts the bike path and the road. That's a detail I'm just noticing. The space, the public space is out there open for everyone to occupy. And windows are on the street, there, there's trees, you know, there's all that. This is not the best example, but five things. We want you to highlight five things um, and write them down. Put the, highlight, put the highlighted image and the five bullet point statements in the PDF and upload that to the space. Are we allowed to reduce the saturation of the background image to kind of bring out the highlights? Yes, you can. And um, there are examples in the slideshow that is also in bright space. Some examples are better than others. And, and preserving the layers, this is not for this week, but in the future, you'll want to, you did this much, save it. You did a little bit more, save that. Save this one, save that one, save this one, save that one, save this one. So you can do an animation because we're going to make a video every week. A one minute video. Okay, we did it. Questions? It seems like a lot. Uh, it is a lot, but it will become routine. It will become inhale, exhale. I think you're going to enjoy it. Okay. If you have individual questions, you can hang back and um, we'll talk.